Before we begin, I have a number of things. These are handouts of the final chart of, that we have been casting for the last two weeks. You can take them if you like, and at the end of the year we will be um, using them. And these are handouts of symbols that you're going to need all the way through. Uh, it's things that we'll be mentioning here and there. And this is sort of like a scorecard or a, a program to let you know the sim what the symbols are. Now, out in front, there are the makings for tea, or I guess even instant coffee if you like. And if you want it, you can make yourself a cup of tea, and you can even do it right in the middle of class. It might be so long that uh, you find that necessary. Also out in front on the center island are a bunch of flowers, and you can take a flower home with you if you like. And if you um, take a vase, please bring the vase back, because I've lost quite a few of them, and I can't get to goodwill to get more all the time. Hi, Sherry. Give one set to Sherry. She needs a set. No, she's got both. All right. Now there's one thing I'm going to mention, and I'm going to mention it only. What'd you set them on anywhere? I'm going to mention it only once, and I don't want to make any to do about it. Uh, because of a lifetime of bad posture. I am now in constant and continuous pain. And uh, sometimes it's severe. And so sometimes I'm going to be distracted. And I'm going to try and hang in there always, but uh, that may happen. Plus, I'm trying to learn a new posture that is less likely to be painful. So uh, please just bear with me. All right. Now what we're going to be doing for most of the rest of the uh, class is we're going to be discussing the simplest and most basic elements of astrology. And even at that, it will be quite a bit to go through. Uh, there's a lot to be learned. What we're going to be doing might be a little peculiar to you. And that's because I'm a little <laughs> peculiar. Uh, what we're trying to do is not only share information. We will be sharing some information, but that's not the intent of the talks. Information is important, but if you try to gain all the information about astrology, it's almost impossible because it approaches infinity, because there's just so much. And people are taking the basic elements and creating new things out of them. Even if we could just impart the information, I wouldn't do it, because um, information is like fuel. And if you put too much fuel on a fire, you choke it and you take all of the uh, life out of it. That's what our education system is like. It's too much information, and it uh, stamps out a lot of the creativity and a lot of the intuitiveness in children. Uh, even if we could computerize all that information, it would still be too much. Instead of that, what we're going to do is we're going to uh, look at some not all, but some of the basic ideas surrounding each of the signs, the houses, the planets, and the aspects. Enough so that you can tune in on the real thing. And when you tune in on the real thing, then you can work with it creatively and you don't have to depend on uh, being information bound. You can use your intuition, 
and you can see everything with new and fresh eyes because human beings are gods in the making and as gods in the making they're doing new things all the time and if you try to apply the last chart to the next it may not work it also frees somebody from being dependent on books and authorities you don't want to be dependent on authorities that gets me off the hook if you're not <laughs> uh, I don't want to be in that kind of a position and it allows for new things that are happening in evolution all the time new things are coming in we're going to try to do a little more than that we're going to try to arouse a new way of looking at the world the way that most people think nowadays is materialistically and linear and that obviously is very good because it has brought us a useful technology and all of those kinds of things but linear thought is inadequate for dealing with the universe which is more than just one layer which is more than just materialism there are always different levels of consciousness and linear thought doesn't help with that so you have to have a different kind of thinking you might say thank God for poetry because it has that kind of thinking that allows you to look at things on different levels now in doing what we're going to do a little bit of temporary fanaticism is commendable uh, <laughs> <laughs> uh, if you really want to learn something you know like the trend in learning a language is called immersion and you really have to dive in and surround yourself with it all the time so what I'm saying is that in order to make this part of you and not just something that you memorize by rote you uh, want to see astrology in everything for a while your friends might find you obnoxious but they'll adjust you know it's always good to put friends in such a place that they have to adjust for something uh, and if you do it in good spirit everybody's the better for it but I will warn you that if you uh, start seeing astrology in everything people are going to start asking you astrological questions and when they ask you astrological questions they want help and uh, it may put you in a difficult place but that's all right too it'll cause you to start using what you know beyond all of these things one of the things we're going to try to do is have fun we don't want to hurtfully ridicule anyone even though Aries is wide open to being hurtfully ridiculed <laughs> uh, but we do want to have some fun I think that all of us have way too much self-importance and all of us need some deflation and the best deflation is being able to laugh at yourself and we're certainly going to do that and if you don't laugh at yourself I'll laugh at you <laughs> I'm just that kind of a guy I have the Sun in one of the signs that's not the most popular sign in the zodiac <laughs> and I'm probably not one of the most popular people in the city we also tend to get bound up in all kinds of pettiness and uh, being able to step back and laugh at things with a big broad perspective sure dissolves a lot of uh, pettiness grab yourself a set of these Jeffrey now in astrology this is going to be modified later on but in astrology there are four fundamental elements 
There are signs, houses, planets, aspects. They're all on the sheets that you have. And they are, these, there are many more than these to some people. But we don't want to get lost in technicality. If anything, this is a uh, spiritual humanistic uh, type of class, and it's not for technophiles. They would probably stomp out in uh, righteous indignation. But, the <laughs> but a little righteous indignation thrown at me doesn't hurt either. We're going to be taking them in this order. Uh, for the next 13 talks, we're going to talk about signs and houses. And then after that, we're going to talk about uh, planets. And uh, then we'll talk about aspects to finish up the year. So this is meant to be a topical class. This is a man on the street or a woman on the street class. I've got to be careful how I use my language in here. I'm outnumbered like many to many to few. And, <laughs> and uh, so uh, it's meant for the person on the street. And so if you're interested in learning technical astrology, that can come out of this. And there are plenty of courses that follow this for people who do want to become technical. In fact, uh, every other Wednesday we have, uh, every other Thursday we have uh, a technical class that's been going on for several years and will be going on for several years more. Tomorrow night we're digging into uh, Oedipus Tyrannus by Sophocles. And if you like storytelling, it'll be just rich with all kinds of storytelling and far-fetched, impossible interpretations thereof. <laughs> <laughs> But, uh, all right, we're all, we're all reading several Sophocles plays together. Signs represent fields of attitude. Signs represent fields of attitude. Each one is a whole in itself. It's a totality. It's got everything you want. But each one has its own slant. There is a good analogy in our culture. And that culture, that, that analogy is, here, I'll pass it. That analogy is our diatonic music system. And in our diatonic music system, we have 12 keys, like the 12 signs of the zodiac. And you can play the same tune in every key, so that each key is equal to each other key. But each key has its own particular nature to it, so that a tune played in one key will sound very different and it'll have a very different feel to it than if played in another key. Another way of looking at it is like looking at the world with 12 different kinds of filters. That is, you know, 12 different colors. And if you did that, you would see that some things stand out better with one hue and other things don't stand out so well. And that's exactly the way it is with the signs of the zodiac. Every sign in the zodiac has the quality of neatness. Well, maybe every sign. We, we'll forget about the Pisces and Sagittarius for a minute. <laughs> but each, one, each, <laughs> each sign has its own sense of order. But some signs are better at it, <laughs> such as Virgo, for example. They're, they're neatness freaks. They're the ones that have the houses that you can't sit in the furniture. Everybody has to sit in the kitchen. Yeah. <laughs> huh? 
Yeah. yeah. So what we're doing then is um, trying to look at each sign as a cosmic standard. And the mandala, oops, now it's time to straighten the mandala out here after the casting is over. The mandala is where each sign is together with its house. And each planet is in its own sign. And everything is just as it should be. This, by the way, was the way the uh, houses came out in the horoscope we all cast together. Ugh. This is a sim the cosmic mandala is a symbolic archetypal statement of the universe in perfect form, the ideal for the whole cosmos. And each sign gives its own outlook, its own standard to, you, to the universe. And tonight we're going to be looking at the standard that is Aries. Now the thing to remember, especially when we're going through a sign that you have something important in, like the sun or the ascendant, and it gets a little hot under the collar, the thing to remember is that all of us have all of the signs, all of the houses, and all of the planets in us. We're absolutely equal in that regard. We have different aspects, but we have the same 12 signs, the same 12 houses, and the same 10 planets. In fact, everybody is horoscopically equal. This is why, even though it is rumored that Hitler studied astrology, uh, Hitler did not accept astrology. They got a man named Werner Kraftian, who was one of the great astrologers of Germany, and they asked him, um, can you tell the difference between the horoscope of a Jew and the horoscope of an Aryan? And he said, the horoscope of a Jew is identical to the horoscope of an Aryan. And therefore, Hitler and those surrounding him decided that astrology could not be a true science <laughs> because it had that kind of equality because they knew that they were the superior people. Each of the signs is like its own mythos. It tells the story of the universe from its own point of view. And there are all kinds of sub-stories, as we're going to see along the way. So we're looking then as the, at the signs as being fields, something more indefinite. We don't want to get too fixed or too concrete of a notion of things, because then we become fixed like uh, what our ideas are like. The houses represent fields of opportunity, mundane opportunity. Houses represent fields of mundane opportunity. In a way, they are abstractions from the signs, but that's a subject that's way too uh, abstract to go into now. And usually the houses, because as we work with them now, are uh, more mundane, they're not as multi-layered as the uh, signs. Even though they're not, uh, not as multi-layered, the houses are more important because they deal more with the nitty grit, the kind of opportunities for everyday use. If you have just the signs, you don't have enough to say uh, where you should go next with your career. You need the houses to be able to, to do the daily things. So the houses represent like opportunities to make money or to lose it or to spend it on friends or to spend it on lovers. And it represents the opportunities to uh, communicate or the opportunities to share 
or the opportunities to have religious experience, opportunities, period. So houses are more like receptacles for the qualities of the signs. And the example that I always use because it works so well is that the houses are like a goblet and the signs are like the grape juice or the lemon juice or whatever you pour in. The quality of the grape juice or lemon juice accommodates itself or molds itself to the kind of experience that you have in the uh, mundane world. Again, everyone has the same 12 houses in their horoscope. And even if you have two people that have the same high signs in the same houses, and there are such people that have everything the same, if you go in some cities, and there's even a website for it, I have a friend that works on that website, it's called Astro Twins. I believe it's called astrotwins.org. And you can find somebody that was born to very close to the same time and same place that you were born. And if you get together with such a person, you can find out that you have amazingly similar things. I met somebody who was born within an hour of myself, and it tickled me pink because she wasn't anything like me. <laughs> well, it's... You know, you can't have the idea of astrology that you're fixed. You know, we, with this materialistic thought, we had this whole idea like, you know, like what you are by DNA is what you're going to be. Well, we're the creative beings and we use DNA as we want to use it in order to produce the kind of body that we need to work out what our character is. And it's wrong to think that things are so fixed. You know, if you took, suppose you took two people and you gave them palettes with three globs of paint and then you gave them the same subject and you told them, all right, here's your canvas, fill up the canvas and use all of the paint painting this subject. Now, you wouldn't expect that you would come up with the same picture from the two people. Not at all but they have the same materials that they're working with and they're, they're trying to the, reach the same objective and it's the same way with a horoscope. You might have all the same materials in the same proportions and you might have similar objectives, but the one life is going to be very different than another. But it's surprising though because human beings are so much like each other and there is very little deviation. It's surprising how much uh, astro twins are alike. <laughs> astro twin is not the same thing as a soulmate. An astro twin is a reality and a soulmate is a dream. It's one of those treacherous things where <laughs> it's one of those treacherous things where people are hoping to heap a fantasy onto somebody else and say, you're my astro twin and the person doesn't stand a chance because they can never live up to what the fantasy is. I, uh, what, uh, you're my soulmate, yeah. Because you know, a person can never live up to that kind of fantasy. It's the worst thing that we can do. If you want to love somebody, don't project your fantasies on them. It puts them in a straitjacket. And don't project astrology on them. Use astrology to draw, draw out what they are, but don't put it on them. One of the people might have um, more experience and the drawings of that person or the painting of that person would look much better. Or one person might be more abstract than another. And so in one case you'd get an abstract uh, a painting that didn't even look anything like the setting, but it would be the idea that it registered in the painter's consciousness. Now, at this point, we're not going to introduce the planets or the aspects. We'll do that when they become pertinent. What we will do is now we're going to go sign by sign by sign. Tonight will be a little longer because we'll be introducing the whole procedure. And the procedure will be very stable and very fixed. We'll add things a little bit as we go along, but for the most part, we want to have a stable format because everything else is unstable. And there, that way you can sort of get a feel of what, you know, uh, what to be ready for. 
Now, as we said earlier, we're not going to be looking at all of the ideas that relate to a given sign or a given house, because we couldn't possibly do that. But we're just trying to give, it a, give you enough so that you can get at the idea. And the idea is the all, because from the idea is where you deduce. And from the idea is what you get intuitions. It becomes the form for intuitions. Now, what we're going to do is not meant as sun sign astrology, like the sun sign astrology that you read in the newspaper. But if you want to take it that way, it's perfectly fine. We will be doing something with the sun in each of the signs. And uh, that's, that's, that's all right. You can't have a closed mind, uh, but I will tell you that uh, there isn't very much to uh, uh, newspaper astrology. It's about as accurate as saying it's going to be cold in January. It, that's true, but it's, uh, you know, it's not really accurate. But it can be very true, whether the person writing the column meant it to be or not. And that is by focusing your intuition on something. It can be anything. I have a friend that lives his entire life by every day, and first thing in the morning and several times throughout the day, he opens the Bible up and puts his finger in. And he takes whatever verse is under his finger and he lives his life accordingly in the situation that he's in. He's ate some awfully strange meals. <laughs> All right. All right. Now, you may not be able to relate to every sign along the way. All right, this is the symbol for Aries. So let's look at the symbology. This is a very ancient symbol that has to do with turning points in our life. When you're doing something new, it's really critical. You're given, it's sort of like the road less traveled by uh, Robert Frost. He came, comes across two roads and he has the choice of taking one or the other. And in mysticism and spiritual studies, the dividing of the way means when you come to a point in your development that you choose the right-hand path or the left-hand path. That is the unselfish path or the selfish. And so that is... Uh, what one of the symbols that it means. We're at the beginning of the zodiac now, and the beginning is just one of those points, and it's a dividing of the ways. And according to the way that we do this, this class, it's going to uh, affect the way all of the other classes are done, because we're at the dividing of the ways. Obviously, the symbol is the ram's head. Aries is the ram. It's strong. It's daring. It's boldly assertive. And it just keeps right on budding. So we're at the beginning of things. And there is a lovely statement in the Bible that describes the brassiness of Aries. When you start, you start out strong. You don't start out uncertain. You start things out in such a way that you want to get something done. And the statement is, if the trumpet sound an uncertain note, who shall come to battle? And that is the character of Aries. It comes out strong. It believes in strength. And it believes in tackling things head on. It's what we would call in the modern parlance somebody that's a straight-up kind of person. Unfortunately, this has some uh, negative sides to it. Like Plato in his Republic has Thrasymachus. And Thrasymachus believes they're discussing justice. 
and he believes that the person who's the strongest is right. And that's sometimes the value that comes where there is a strong assertion of Aries. In fact, that is something, yeah, we've got a literary crowd in here today because I'm picking up all kinds of literary uh, things that I want to allude to. Uh, if you ever read the Song of Roland, which I'm sure all of you have, have read. <laughs> 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 the song of Roland is the story of Orlando, uh, sometimes called Roland Dubois, and it's the story of the French peers in the, car in the court of Charlemagne fighting against those dirty Saracens. It's that kind of a thing. And they believed that when a person was in battle, the person who was the most moral won. That's, in, that, that's, that's the opposite way around, but it's the same kind of idea. And if most people are equal in strength to each other, that's just what you would figure. Because if you're abstracted or distracted by uh, your guilt, or you know, you cannot give yourself, you can't come straight on, enough. You, can, you can't hit thing, things directly. And this is the principle of Aries, you know, that uh, you are likely to be stronger if that's the case. One of the things that we do straight on is that we thrust. And so some people see this as a hilt and they put on a handle and it's a dagger. And so knives and sharp blades and other Freudian types of objects that men like, <laughs> like to throw around are ruled by Aries. In fact, even some women, but we won't go into that, will we? <laughs> I'm gonna, she, she's a strong woman, so I, 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 can lay, I can lay anything out tonight, and we're going to have a great time with it. So it's the, the whole idea of thrust is an Aries idea. The whole idea of being sharp or of culling or cleaning things out in that way. Other people have seen it the other way around. They see this is the handle and they see it as a hammer. We'll talk about that later. The hammer of Thor or the hammer of Hiram. Some people see it as these are the eyebrows and this is, these are the eyes. Because Aries rules the face, it rules the snout. And in the first house, the first house rules the outer appearances of someone. You can tell people by, by their nature. I worked for a professor that was, had very strong uh, Aries tendencies, and he always led with his nose. He, you know, he had his nose out there in everybody's business, especially the grad students <laughs> who hated him. Another way of looking at the symbol is that this is the alpha. And the alpha was always the beginning of the year, at least the beginning of the growth year. Everybody wants to be first. They want to be the starter. Me first, I was in first place. Those are all Aries concepts. All right, let's move on to the next part of understanding Aries, and that is the animals. The word zodiac is from two Greek words, zoos and kaikel which means zoos is animal, which is where our study of zoology and zoos comes from, and keikel is where our word cycle or circle comes from. So this is a circle of animals. What most people call the astral plane, I call the desire world, and uh, in some parts in the Orient, it's called the world of animals, and it's called in the Barva Chakra, or Barbara Chuck, 
Yeah, all right, all right. You can get on my case. <laughs> you have latitude to do so. Uh, it's called the world of the animals. And that is because the plants, the animals, and the minerals do not have yet indwelling spirits. They can't say, I am. And they can't be entire universes on their own. Some animals are coming close to that, but they haven't, that hasn't been born yet. And so they are brought through different kinds of experiences to, break, uh, to bring to them different kinds of consciousness. And they're brought to those experiences by spiritual intelligences which work through the desire world. And they lead them into their experiences. This is airy, so we can talk about competition. Uh, in some ways, Charles Darwin was right. Competition is how things are accomplished in the outer evolution that is part of the whole creation. Because in competition, the spirits that are guiding the predator are competing with the spirits that guide the prey. And their charges grow according to uh, what the kinds of experiences that are brought, brought to them. And if it's a life and death situation, you're going to run really fast if you're a rabbit. And, you know, by going back and forth, uh, you, uh, you get, uh, you know, gradually both sides grow. There's a, um, a novella and some short stories by a writer called Rick Bass. And he talks about the co-evolution of bats and moths. How the uh, bats can pick up the moths in the dark and eat them up. And then the moths start changing frequencies. And then the bats learn those new frequencies. And they're constantly evolving in that way. And it's such a thing that if the frequencies keep getting higher and higher, the bats will be able to function in the daytime. And uh, it's, you know, so it's just uh, that, it's that kind of a thing that's involved with uh, animals and whoever leads them. However, each animal species, and sometimes families and subfamilies and things like that, uh, has, is a specialization of a cosmic attitude. And groups of those cosmic attitudes are what the signs are. So each of the signs has a number of attitudes that are associated with it. And because the animals aren't a whole yet, they're not a complete universe in themselves, they don't have a total horoscope. They specialize in the things of their species. You know, it's not, you're not going to easily get a cat to uh, want to live on string beans. It can be done, but it's not going to be an easily, easy, easily done thing. So what we're going to do is going to be a little bit uh, shallow about it, but we're going to talk about animals associated with Aries. First, let's look at a general category of birds, even though specific birds are ruled by different signs of the zodiac Birds, in general, are ruled by Aries. Birds function at a really high temperature. And temperature is an intensive relationship. Not heat, but temperature. And that's what Aries is. Aries likes it intense. The more intense, the better. And like birds are usually all out. You don't find a sloth among the birds. Uh, I have a little garden that I keep behind the store here. And in the neighborhood, back and forth in the backyards, there's a wren. And that wren sings all day long for most of the summer. But if you get close enough and watch that wren, that wren puts every bit of energy that it has into its song. It just shivers and throws everything it's got into the song. And it does it all day long. We would be pooped 
you know, very few, because we got all that ego hold back consciousness. If we had to try to do that, we would be pooped in, in three or four songs and we wouldn't be able to do it all day long because we have the friction of ego. That's, one of the, that's why we can't fly too, because we can't release our energy because we're spending so much energy defending our ego consciousness that we, it isn't available to us for, for other things. If you watch the birds, I like to do it. I find it a very peaceful kind of thing. They dart and they flitter. And that's like Aries. It doesn't want to stay one place too long. It just puts out its extreme exertions and it goes on to something else. Above all, they're proud. And if you look at them, with the exceptions of ducks, which are obviously a Pisces animal with that spoon bill and waddling feet and things like that, it can't be anything but a Pisces animal, they have pointy features. And the fiery signs rising have a pointed feature quality. But there are several birds that are especially Aries. Roosters. <laughs> they love that plumage. You know what cockerel of the walk means? They like to strut, and they like to strut their stuff. They throw their chest way out there. Cock of the walk. And they'll fight. And they'll fight no holds barred. This is why in a lot of forms of magic, the world over, because of that spirited quality, people who do primitive blood magic use roosters, because the roosters have that quality in the blood. I don't know if I want to go too much into that subject. The rooster is like Aries. It crows to signify the dawn. It means the first house, the start of the day, is what they're interested in. I had a really interesting uh, uh, experience. I traveled by bus through South America for 13 weeks last, last winter, and I was in a little uh, suburb about 30 miles outside of uh, Bogota, it was called Fakava. And uh, I'm staying at these people's house, and uh, I'm, I'm asleep, and I'm way out somewhere. And then something happens. I have a really strange dream. In this dream, a face comes at me, and its eyes are opened wide, and its mouth is open, and it screams at me. And at that very second, a cock crowed right outside the window. And that was, the spirit was warning me ahead of me that something was terrible was coming. <laughs> because if you come back to your body too fast and you come crashing into your body, you can destroy the connections between the etheric brain and the physical brain. And so I was being warned so that I didn't come back with a start and harm myself. You know, like people who are spastics, you know, they, they have a special kind of epilepsy where the etheric brain is, is a little bit muddled. And uh, that is the uh, consequences of an, of an action like that. Of course, the females get in there too. And there are chickens. If you've ever grown up on a farm, you know that um, chickens are not the kindest animals in the barnyard. If they see one speck of blood, or if they see one what they consider a deformity, all the chickens in the roost will go on that chicken and they'll peck it to death. It's cruel. See, the thing is, is if you identify with energy, you're identifying with the expression of energy. And you're not always aware of how the other person is feeling the energy. That comes on the opposite side of the zodiac. So you, there is, in all the fiery signs, but especially Aries, there's a tendency 
to cruelty. And where Aries is uh, in your horoscope indicates the place that you're most likely to be cruel. No wonder I'm not married. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, <laughs> no, he's the Taurus. Roosters and chickens have cannibal tendencies. And I, I try to make a special point in these talks to talk about the inhumane things we do to animals. And do you know, I have a friend that lives in, or she lived, she's not there anymore, in Arkansas. I don't know if you've ever been in Arkansas, but every place in Arkansas, you go down the roads, the houses may be dumps, but in the back, they've got these metal pole shed chicken barns, and they're all selling uh, chickens to the big chicken producer, I forget, Tyson. Tyson is an Arkansas company, and Tyson has the high bred chickens. And so this lady got some regular chicks, and then somebody said, well, why don't you take some of these Tyson chicks? And she just threw out feed every day and raised them naturally, and her chicks grew just fine. But they were nothing like the Tyson chicks, which were monstrous. And the Tyson chicks were raised to spend their entire life in a little crib and to get really big and have just the kind of meat that they wanted. But the Tyson chicks, when she left them out to be free-range chickens, they grew so big, so fast, that their bones couldn't support them, and they broke their own legs. Yeah, that's really something. And one of the things is uh, they have to harvest, which is the euphemism that they use, they have to harvest the uh, chickens or the roosters at a certain time because they're very Aries. If you go one or two days past the prime time, they start fighting. And it's like an Aries, uh, Aries situation. The last man left standing is the winner. <laughs> uh, yeah. And they will all kill each other until there is one <laughs> left. <laughs> Would you like a glass of water? <laughs> <laughs> but at the same time, we have the word chicken. It's the Aries quality, if you remember the Iliad, Aries, A-R-E-S, which is the uh, Greek Mars. When he gets wounded in battle, I believe it was um, Glaucus. I'm not sure, but I think it's Glaucus that wounds him. And he goes running off the battlefield like a great big chicken. My blood! My blood! <laughs> it's something like that. And uh, that happens with Aries. Uh, there is that thing that's, they can be frightened. Oh, it was Diomedes. I got it here in the notes. All right. But they like new things. Even very domesticated uh, animals, that ca hens that can't get around, will always scratch up something new. Aries is the sign of newness. It likes to have things new. If it's in the rising sign, it's got to have new clothes all the time. You know? <laughs> and once, once the feeling of newness is worn off, those clothes are no good anymore. Chicks are ruled by Aries. What is the beginning of the year but a breakthrough? And when a chicken pecks through an egg, that's a major breakthrough. It comes into the world working. If you can direct Aries, you've got a really hard working sign because it's got all of that energy and it has to go somewhere. But without direction, it'll go anywhere. It's explosive. It'll blow this way and that. Obviously, uh, pheasants are ruled by Aries. They're big crowers, <coughs> and they're seed eaters. They like eating seed because seed has that fine oil, and that burns hot. So they like, they like that. 
another animal ruled <laughs> rule by Aries. Turkeys are <laughs> ruled by Aries. And the turkeys like to thunder, and they do that from uh, pride. And strangely enough, a thing and its opposite are always found in the same sign. Turkeys are exceedingly brave, and they are exceedingly fearful at the same time. Not fearful, but they're alarmable. Do you know what will happen with, uh, if you frighten a bunch of uh, domesticated turkeys? They'll all head for a lead turkey, and they'll pile on the lead turkey, <laughs> and the ones that are underneath will suffocate. Yeah. It's, 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 it's really quite an interesting phenomenon. <laughs> and they're potent. Aries likes to think that it's really a potent sign. Well, turkeys are potent. Of all of the animals that we commonly know, they're most likely to parthenogenesis, if you know what parthenogenesis is. Parthenogenesis is virgin birth. Not, uh, not um, palingenesis. Palingenesis is spiritual rebirth. Like if you're a twice-born Christian, that is uh, palingenesis. But parthenogenesis happens, and it happens with uh, reasonable frequency in turkeys. Imagine that. The turkey, all it has to do is strut up and down the fence with the, with the hens on the other side, and they get pregnant. That is potency, you know. Aries all think they've got that anyway. <laughs> They're very, very cagey, extremely cagey birds. Uh, Benjamin Franklin uh, uh, thought that the national bird should not be the eagle, it should be the turkey, because it was brave and especially because it was cagey. They may be brave, they may be cagey. Yeah, Mark Twain tells a story of chasing a wild turkey all day long, and every time he thought he was going to get it, it got away on him. It, the, it, the turkey was leading him away from its little ones, is what it was doing. It was, it was doing like uh, birds sometimes do that. Well, there's a famous bird, the um, lapwing does that all the time. That's a famous symbol in the mystery schools. But uh, very cagey. But in terms of intelligence, Aries, or I should say <laughs> the uh, turkeys, are not the brightest bulbs on the tree. Uh, we, uh, we, they get teased for that. Domesticated turkeys will uh, drown themselves. You know, they've been hybridized in such a way that they don't have, uh, they have like an open beak. And if it's raining, they'll put their beak out in the air like that and they'll get drowned to death. Crazy what we do to them. Probably no bird is more Aries like than the hummingbird. Very, very high temperature, and they really like fast burning food. And uh, they like fog to cool off. When I, many years ago, I lived in Southern California, and I learned that if you hold a hose and make a fine mist, the hummingbirds will come. You can get them right as close as David is to me. They'll, they'll come, and they'll go right through that mist. They'll fly back and forth, because they need to cool off, because they're so high. They have those almost metallic fen uh, feathers that look like armor, and Aries love armor. Anything that's tight, Aries wants to wear. <laughs> Especially if it's got epaulets or those, you see those people that wear those uh, like little army caps and things like that. That's an Aries kind of thing. And hummingbirds are competitors. They're so competitive that they will drive each other off. I once stayed in a motel in the middle of nowhere in White Canyon, Utah. The uh, motel was built by a man who had been a, a uranium miner, and when the uranium mining closed out, what he did is he just stayed on, and he opened a motel. And 
very few people ever stayed at the motel, so I was treated like a king for staying there. And he had a big, long veranda, a Texas-style veranda, across the front of the place. And on either end, he had a hummingbird feeder. And there were as many as 20 hummingbirds at each feeder. And they would be fighting each other off from the uh, feeder more than they would be using the feeder. It's that, that kind of competition, you know, like uh, men in their athletics kind of a thing. All right, let's get to the classic. The classic is the ram. Headstrong. Enormous, enormous pride. They're really forward about fighting. And they have, they're, it's almost like an army procedure. And in a way, it's almost exactly like um, a duel. Mano a mano. Two rams will be right next to each other. And then they'll walk away from each other as if the other one doesn't exist. And you'll get so many paces apart. And it is almost as if you flip a switch and they'll both turn and they'll come ramming as hard as they can at each other. And it like, like it was all pre-designated, but it, it's, it, it's very ritualistic. It's extremely, you know, it's like a duel. It's like a, a great big fight. My father, uh, he and I were out in the North Woods at one time, and we, my brother was, it was, is an avid canoer, and we left them off one place, then we took two cars and left the other car so that they could get, get the canoe back on the car later on. And as we're at the place where we dropped the car off, my father starts talking to this old farmer up in the north woods and he has rams and uh, he's got sheep and he's got two rams and he says you can't have two rams you have to have one he said I had this young ram and he said the two of them were always fighting and they wouldn't give up and the little one was getting the worst of it and so what he did, he said, I, I couldn't stand it anymore. So finally, I put them in two different pens, you know, like with that wire about four inches square, so that they would be apart from each other. And he said, wouldn't you know it, what happened? They wanted to fight so much. Aries loves to fight. They love to mix it up. The two rams would each part from the fence. <laughs> And they'd go so many paces, and they'd turn around, and they'd come charging to each other, and they'd meet each other at the fence. But the little one caught on. And eventually, after a while, they'd take their paces, and they'd come charging at each other, but the little one would stop, and you know, go boom <laughs> into the fence. <laughs> doesn't, have, doesn't have a whole lot to do with Aries, but, but they're very bold. Aries is probably the boldest sign. If you're going to start something, you, gotta, you don't want, you don't want a, a shrinking violet. You want a, somebody that, has, that is bold. In fact, Aries is so bold, uh, I have a belief that all of the temptations of uh, Jesus that are given, the three temptations that are given of Jesus, each of them has something to do with the basic nature of a human being. And he's taken up to a high place, and he's told to jump off, and that the angels will protect him and all of that. But do you know there is that tendency? If you get up to very high cliffs or places like that in the mountains, there are two counter ten tendencies. One is you're horrified of what a fall it is, and the other tendency is you want to do it. You want to jump. And the sheep... Uh, especially the rams, sometimes are bold enough that they do it. It's not an unknown thing for a ram to go diving off the cliff. <laughs> As we said, <laughs> we, won't, we won't stress that point too much. <laughs> uh, sheep. Again, when you have a strong leader, if you take a tree that has, oh, OK, 
Okay. If you have a tree that has a central stem with no competition, all of the branches, like we're talking here like a spruce tree or something, all the branches come off at right angle. When you have a strong leader, you have strong followers. And the same sign that rules leaders has excellent followers. Sheep are great followers. If you have a bellwether, all of the sheep will follow after it. This is what militarism is about. You can, you can feel as an individual that you're not so individualized that you're apart from everything else. But if you're in a uniform, which Aries loves, loves to be in a uniform, that then you're part of something really strong. And that's what the, the sheep are like. If someone is different, we all know about black sheep and what happens to them. They get pushed away and they're treated tremendously uh, cruel. In the same way that there's energy in chicken's blood that is ideal for people who do that basic kind of magic, there is also energy in sheep's wool that there isn't there in cotton or in other things. I had a friend that was mediumistic and uh, what he would do when he wanted to know something about some condition that was coming up or some person or something like that, he'd take off all of his clothes and he'd take a 100% wool blanket facing north-south and he'd lay on his back on that, uh, uh, <laughs> on that wool blanket. <laughs> And he'd pick up enough energy so that he'd go into his mediumistic kind of uh, thing and be able to pick up what he wanted to pick up. Wool is like that. It has very good properties. I used to not like it. And now if I wear stockings, which I don't, which is why I wear long-legged pants so you don't see. <laughs> um, uh, wool, I love it now. It has really good properties. Aries are incisive. We know the um, cowboy movies, they always hated the sheep farmers in the cowboy movies. And they hated the sheep farmers because the sheep are incisive. The cows, when a cow eats grass, it holds it against the teeth and then it rips it off with its tongue. And therefore it doesn't get mowed way down and it can come back. But if you have sheep, they have incisive and they, incisive bites and they chew things right down to the root crown. And when they chew things down to the root crown, what happens is it doesn't come back sometimes. And this is why it isn't, it isn't just to make drama in the, in, the, uh, in the cowboy movie. It's there for a reason that, that that's the case. Boy, we're going terribly slow. This, this could end up being pretty long tonight, perhaps even as long as two hours or something like that. Lambs. There's something about lambs that are their universal symbol of purity and innocence and childlikeness. There are kids but they don't get the same kind of press that the lambs get. And that's because it's Aries. Now Aries, for all of its bluster and all of its struggle and all of that, is pretty uncomplicated. It's simple. And there's something pure about that simplicity. And in that, that kind of lamb-like purity and simplicity, if it's all only just energy and no complications have set in, you can see how it goes like that. that and so that's, that's what the lamb represents. Of course, we um, know what they do to lambs. <laughs> the same thing that they do to uh, baby calves. They put them in dark padded rooms. And all they do is eat. And they eat until they're a certain age where, they're, where they are tender and then they're slaughtered. They never develop their eyes because well, everybody in the class will probably be vegetarian by the end of the year. And if that happens, I'll consider that the greatest accomplishment. <laughs> <laughs> 
Think about that the next time you pile a lamp chop on. Sometimes an animal and its prey are in the same signs. Like the chickens love the family of insects that are ruled by Aries. Grasshoppers. At this time of the year you go out and you see the grasshoppers and you don't know where they're going to go. They don't know where they're going to go. They leap and that's it. Now Aesop, who wrote Aesop's fable, every fable that I've ever read in Aesop's fable is highly astrological. And the look before you leap is where the ram leaps into a hole. And then you have the ant and the grasshopper. The grasshopper is not future provident because it's intent on living now. There's all this greenery here. I might just well pig out. And that's what it does. So that's, you know it's summer when the grasshoppers are there. They like high temperatures. And they like it dry. And air, they have to be Aries-like. They carry their armor with them. And in the southwest, if you catch grasshoppers and you turn them over, there are species that have the symbol of Aries right on their belly. That's really quite a thing to see. Um, another one that is a thermometer, crickets. They like high temperature. They're competitive. Uh, they'll fight and they'll... Uh, not only fight to the finish, but they'll actually kill and eat each other. Uh, quite something. And uh, there are temperature lovers. If you catch a cricket, like right outside now, it, you, they're hard to catch because they, they like, like to leap all over the place. But once you catch it and hold it in your hand, you can open your hand up and it won't, won't leap away because it gets to like how hot it is. And if you've got Aries rising or something like that, and you've got a hot hand, they really like that. They're like thermometers. Have you ever heard that music, cricket music, where somebody took cricket singing and slowed it down to what we hear? And it is tremendously beautiful music. It's harmonic, and it's got, uh, you know, it's got waves running through it. It's just really quite beautiful. I think if you probably did a Google search on cricket music, you could probably get a... Uh, 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 <laughs> Cicadas, more of the same. Locusts, more of the same thing. And um, some would say almost any ravenous uh, animal would be ruled by Aries, but that's way too much of a generalization. Seasonally, when the sun is in Aries, the sun is always the hero. It is, represents the self or the ego. And uh, the cycle of the sun represents, at least to our uh, northern hemisphere, it represents the, uh, the story of the hero. So when the sun is in Aries, we have all of the harsh, sudden changes and the reversals. We have the equinoctial winds. And it's sort of like spring coming in is like a fist fight that goes back and forth. And the army of the sun raises its blades to the, to the general. If you watch the first grass when it comes out, they all look like little little spears. It's really quite beautiful. And there are the bursting buds, most notably the pussy willows. Now the willows are all ruled by cancer, but the pussy willow, which is where aspirin comes from, is to the head, which is ruled by Aries. Quite interesting. Violets, some of the violets put out their flowers. They're really bold. They put out the flower before they put out any leaves. And that's really an Aries type of quality. It's a time when animals wake from their hibernation and they're hungry and they're violent. And it's the time of newcomers in the form of migrations. It's a time of nesting 
and nursing and birth. That's what Aries is like. Mythologically, mythology is the language of the spiritual worlds. and It's the language of the gods. And so from mythology, we get some of the life of the stories that is the life of the signs of the zodiac and the planets and so on. So if we look at some of the astrological principles, uh, some of the mythological principles in astrological ways, it's very helpful. What I find is from the Old Testament to the Bible, the myth of Hiram. If you remember the story, Hiram, there are, there are two streams. Uh, Eve, you have to get some of it from the, uh, from the other texts than the Bible because the Bible has been purged by the children of water. And it's made to be a goody-goody document. But if you read something like the Nag Hammadi things, you find out that Eve mated with a demon called the Lucifer spirit named Samael. And the result of that union was Cain, who slew his brother Abel. But after that, uh, Adam knew Eve, knew was their way, because the only, that's the only way they knew somebody was there, was in coition, because they didn't have the senses open yet. And the only the way that they knew someone was there was in that intense feeling in coition. And uh, when they drew together, Adam knew Eve, and Seth was born. And ever after, if you look carefully in the Bible, there are two streams. There are the children of fire, and there are the children of water. They are the Canaanites and the children of Seth, the, the descendants of Seth. And they are two different ways of looking at the world. The children of water do everything by faith. They do everything by following authority. They are mystic types. They're sometimes called Catholics because they feel their way through everything. The children of fire, the Canaanites, do everything by knowledge and by works. It carries right into the, the, into the letters in the New Testaments, not the Pauline letters, but the other uh, apostles. There's the big battle about faith and works, and which is, which is which. But at any rate, the Freemasons or the occultists, not in the terrible word that occultism has come to take now, occult merely means hidden. And an occultist is somebody who does something by knowledge and demonstrations of energy and power. Astrology is an occult art. That doesn't mean that it's unchristian. Uh, the Gospels are just filled with astrology, if you know where to look for them. We'll do a little bit of that later on. But there's the story of the building of the temple. David could not build the temple because he was a man of war. It says that outright. And because Solomon was a man of peace, he was allowed to build the temple. Well, Solomon was a child of Seth. He was a water baby. And by faith, he got the plan from heaven to build the temple. But he couldn't build it. And he had to go to the children of fire to build the temple. And he had to get Hiram Abiff. And Hiram Abiff is the mason's mason, the magician's magician, the builder's builder. And he built the temple. And uh, when it was finished, Solomon had this thing with the Queen of Sheba, as we all. <laughs> We're getting very far afield here. But uh, the Queen of Sheba came and said, hey, you got nice digs here. Uh, how did you build it? And Solomon said, I built it. She said, by yourself? And he said, no, I had help. Well, let me see your help. And he couldn't call the builders because the builders were masons. And they wouldn't come to the call of, uh, of a Catholic. They wouldn't come to the call of, of a feeler. So he had to get Hiram in. 
and you can bet that Hiram came strutting in wearing tights or something like <laughs> <laughs> And uh, Solomon, you know, says to him, I want to, I want to, the lady would like to see your men. I'm sure he took out his little hammer and in a, in, in a very subtle way made a few little taps and all the men showed up. Of course, the rivalry got him nowhere, and according to the mystical version of it, after the building of Solomon's temple was over, Hiram tried to eclipse the whole thing. He tried to build the alchemical molten sea out in front of it. And the molten sea was to take all of the elements and melt them down and to make a liquid crystal out of them so that you could see and know anything because everything was in the construction of it. Uh, but what happened is, is that the waterlings got jealous. And when he was firing the molten sea, they came and threw water in. And this caused all kinds of explosions. And uh, Hiram uh, did the kind of thing that fire people do. He dove into the molten sea and went to the center of the earth. And he remained there until he was called forth as Lazarus. Jesus was later reborn as, uh, Solomon was later reborn as Jesus, which is not the Christ. And uh, Hiram was later reborn as Lazarus. And the rising, raising of Lazarus is the union of the two sides in terms of uh, the works and faith are brought together in the figure of the Christ Jesus. And that being later on, after that rising was John the Beloved, and later on was supposedly Le Comte de Saint Germain, who did all of those miracles and magic and everything else. And uh, he was asked in the court of Louis, when he was in the court right before the French Revolution, uh, he was asked about the Philosopher's Stone, and he gave a one-liner, and he said, I know now that the Philosopher's Stone is not made by fire alone, but by fire and water. And that's a tremendous, that, that in that one sentence is a summing up of two different types of temperaments of humanity finally being merged in one, uh, in one figure. All right, but you get the whole idea. Energy and the direction of energy. Aries is the sign of builders. I frankly believe that the east side of Madison around uh, Willie and Baldwin where all of those unemployed carpenters live. <laughs> <laughs> there, that, that neighborhood is filled with unemployed car carpenters. I'm, I'm sure that's an Aries kind of love neighborhood. They're builders. They are architects, archi, meaning primordial, tecton being the basic energy, architecton, builders of primordial energy. And that's what Aries is all about. It is about building. I suppose we're, well, we're not too bad yet. We're only at 80 minutes. Let's stay with the Bible. The um, Bible is filled with religious things, both the Old and New Testament. But it's not all textbook astrology, but some of it is, especially in the Old Testament. We have the story of Abraham who was to sacrifice his son Isaac. And he went to the point of almost slitting his throat when he was told to stop. That he was faithful even unto the death. So faithful that he didn't use his head. But, <laughs> but at any rate, he was stopped. And he was told that his descendants would be as the stars of the sky. And that means two things, both in number and in quality. His grandson, Jacob, who wrestled with an angel 
and after, after wrestling with an angel was called Israel. And he had 12 sons and a daughter. And in Exodus and in Deuteronomy, is it in Exodus? No, I believe it's in Genesis and Deuteronomy. I've got it in the notes here somewhere. The uh, 12 tribes, he, he, for his children, he prophesies for them. And his prophecies are exactly descriptions, thumbnail descriptions of the signs of the zodiac. It's really, really interesting. Um, in fact, Josephus, the Jew who was a Roman citizen who wrote the histories, writes that at the time of Jesus that the uh, uh, 12 tribes of Israel assembled under astrological banners. And when they encamped anywhere, they encamped in astrological formation. So it's just filled in there. So every now and then Jacob would lie down like he was going to die and he would have a prophecy. And what he says of Gad, Gad is the son that relates to Aries. He dwelleth as a lion and teareth the arm with the crown of the head. And that is the nature of Aries. It's mean, it's savage, it's vicious, it's terrible, at least on a physical level. On another level, it's intellectual courage. And there's a scarce little bit of that in the institutions. Everybody wants to be academically proper. They don't have enough Aries there. They don't have uh, intellectual courage or courage of their convictions to state something. Cosmologically, cosmology is the study. Cosmogony is the study of the creation of the universe and cosmology is the study of the birth of the cosmos. And since we're dealing with the first sign of the zodiac, we can deal with the cosmogony this time. St. John's Gospel tells us one of the most profound things in the first sentence, in the beginning was the Word. But there's a lot of question about what the nature of that Word was. One of my favorite poets, Jorge Luis Borges, writes about poets who learn to write one-word poems that you can read over again and again, and each time you go into them, you go into them more deeply. It's not a kind of word that we use now where we have precise definitions. It is a word of power. It is a tone that organizes all of the different spiritual worlds and everything in them. Astronomers think that word was a big bang. <laughs> they think like Aries, young Aries. It was just all one big firecracker that went off and that's it. They're, you know, they're kind of veneer. They can't go into the deeper spiritual worlds and they try to put everything on the material worlds. So they think it was like a fiat or a fiat, a command, a shout, an order, giving directions. Aries love fireworks. Cops like to shoot. They're ruled by, uh, ruled by Aries. Do you know that police officers are terrible witnesses? They train them and train them to be good witnesses, but they're, they're, they turn out to be terrible because they, you know, they're all into this energy thing. They like the uniforms, you know. You know, there's something like when you <laughs> that when you when you wear a uniform, you know, you think you're something special. You know, it's called being badge happy or something like that. It's sort of for them. It's like saying, "Here I am. This is me." But if everything starts out with one burst of energy, there's a good deal of self-reliance in it. And it's a self-starter. Self-reliance is a great word for Aries. And self-starting, where you don't have to depend on anyone outside of you. There's a will to be. 
other people have different ideas. The uh, Chinese thought that the original word was a laugh. And I kind of agree with that. Uh, Sigmund Freud has very good things to say about the, the psychology of humor. That we laugh at things about which we have had insecurity and when that insecurity is relieved we feel so good we laugh. And the whole of creation in one way is like an insecurity. You know, like any time you do any creative piece of work, you say, is this going to be all right? Can I even do this? You know what I mean? And then you get it said, and there's, it's a relief. And so I believe it uh, is a uh, laugh. Scorpio would probably think the original word was a fart. <laughs> <laughs> Scorpio-Gemini combinations are terrible that way. I hate to say it, I'm a man that lives partially on social security, but I still love fart jokes. <laughs> it's, it's, it's a night of all kinds of holy and unholy conf uh, confessions. In any case, it's a start. All starts are ruled by Aries. It is an initiation. If you've ever seen a fight, the person who has throws the first blow has, uh, has the initiative. They've got the advantage. If you've been knocked to the deck, it takes a lot of courage to come to pick yourself up and go back in it again. And it's an interesting thing. The phenomenon of you know, throwing a blow is psychologically like projection. I have never seen a fight yet where the person who threw the first blow didn't say, he made me do it. When I was young, I used to, you know, I used to go to beer bars, which were the thing in those days, and you'd see bar fights, and the person who threw that first punch, he made me do it. You know, it was like, it's like it was a matter of necessity it had to be done. I had no choice but to do this. And I can think there's something of a, of a rationale in that, that a person is led one way or another. You can like starts. Everybody knows this about Aries. It's in every newspaper thing that Aries likes starting things. It just doesn't like continuing them. You know, like if you want to get something started, get in Aries. If you want to get something done, get rid of them. Uh, I believe after traveling around, I believe that all of Mexico is ruled by Aries. <laughs> <laughs> there, there are all of those building starts that never, never got finished. They don't even have an excuse for it. I've been in that place in uh, Arizona that's behind the Grand Canyon there. It's called Colorado City. And uh, it's behind the Grand Canyon, and it's sort of immune to the rest of the laws of the rest of the state in terms of the laws. And that's where the uh, polygamists live. They don't live in Utah. They live across the border in Arizona, but in the part of Arizona uh, that, um, that uh, is hard to get to. And what happens is it's, you know, a, a, you, a man will have a wife that's in her 50s, a wife that's in her 40s, one that's in her 30s, one that's in her 20s, and one that's in her teens, and sometimes even younger than that. Uh, it is sort of like that stag kind of consciousness. But the interesting thing is, is they have a law in that city, is that you don't have to pay taxes on unfinished improvements. <laughs> I mean, it's an odd, odd place. It may have changed by now because they're trying to clean their act up. Um, philosophically, sometimes it's almost impossible to understand a complex idea by looking directly at its components. You have to go to something really simple 
the same uh, professor that I was speaking of earlier that led with his nose, or he's still alive yet, he still leads with his nose, uh, was world famous because his experiments worked. And his experiments worked because he knew how to keep it simple. If you keep something simple, you can accomplish something. You can bring something into existence, which is what initiation is all about. It's starting something and building something new. That's a really, really important thing. Keep it simple. <coughs> Dale, who is doing all of the camera work over there, we, we've done a lot of construction, and this place would look like a dump if it weren't for him with all of his help. Uh, he has the uh, constructor's, uh, uh, what do they call it, <laughs> acronym, KISS. Keep it simple, sweet, is that what it is? <laughs> when everything starts, it's uniform. In spring, when the shoots come out, they all look the same. You can't tell the weeds from the plants that you, that you want. So for Aries, to do is to be. You cannot be without doing. Now, this is not a sign that you expect is going to sit around and ponder. This is not a sign that wants to get stagnant. It knows its existence in doing. And sometimes the more simple the doing, the better. That simplicity is often primal. If the person is not a very uh, advanced person, it's primitive. If the person is really adventurous, it's pioneering. If anything you have to pioneer, you go to Aries. As we said, it's self-reliant. And depending on the nature of the individual, it is either childlike or childish. If you think about it, this is existentialism in the simplest terms. Being is everything. There's only being and nothing. And if you're doing, you know you are. So this Aries is in some ways an existential sign. It's self-realization. It is self-realization by knowing that you exist. And you know that you exist by interacting with the world around you. And the more strongly you interact, the better. So it's a confrontational sign. It confronts the world. And there are times that that's important. And since there's only being, there's only me. Therefore, when you interact with anything, there is identification. So Aries is a very identifying sign. I identify with this or I identify with that. This, but this is where the weakness comes in. If you identify with something, that weakens you. You've given yourself over to that which you identify with. So you can see that there are all kinds of uh, philosophical and psychological principles in the sign. It has to respect itself. It is pride in the po positive sense of the world. It appreciates itself. And there's no shortage of appreciation. Well, we just hit 90 minutes. So it is always being itself in becoming, even if there's friction that comes out of it. The friction gives you new light, new heat. In all cases, it loves newness, novelty, freshness. Somebody that you slap in the face for being fresh because they had the nerve to pinch you, that's Aries. 
It's the original intent. Like, um, I happen to be a very great fan of Glurk. And I love his or uh, Orpheus in Eurydice. It's one of the most beautiful pieces of music that I've ever heard in my life. We'll talk about it later on. But I went to uh, buy a copy of the whole opera. I went to see Charles. You all know who Charles is. Charles Lundy in that store down in the basement on State Street there. The old guy, he must be 80 years old. I, I don't know if he's alive, but he, he's got golden ears. He hears everything. And he must have a lot of Aries in him somewhere. And there, because he said, well, there are four versions. Which version do you want? Do you want the one that was refined for the French opera? Or do you want the original intent? And I went with the original intent. And you get the spirit, the identity. Here the identification comes in again. You get the identity of the creator in their original intent. This is what I meant to do. So there are all kinds, you know, I don't know how much to say on this because there are all kinds of, um, all kinds of things that we could go into and we're already overstayed. Um, it's a sign that likes life. Not life in the abstract, but in its vital sense. It likes things vigorous. It likes things energetic. In literature, it's naturalism. Naturalism is uh, Darwinism taken into the arts and uh, made extreme. So, you know, like the world is a jungle. It's dog eat dog. <laughs> and that's uh, an Aries kind of way of looking at it. You know, it's, it's, you know what something is. You can identify. Let's have it out. We'll see who the better man is, you know, right away when you have that. <laughs> I've seen people like that. And it doesn't have to be for fanfare. Aries does like to strut for the ladies if it's a male, but it doesn't have to be that way. I remember when we were teenagers in high school, if there was a struggle between two people, you drove out into the country and you let them out on a side road and they had it out with each other. <laughs> you see, you know, you, you, you. nature force. All of the forces of nature are found in the signs and planets. Aries, a nature force, fire. But the fire that is Aries is flame. It's like burning paper. It's intense, it's bright, it's dazzling, and Aries loves dazzling, but it doesn't last. The whole principle of oxidation, oxidation that releases energy and that produces change. Aries can't stand a life without change. Energy release. Not just fireworks, but anything that releases energy. If the energy release is controlled, it's courage and bravery. If it's uncontrolled, it's temerity or foolhardiness. Anatomically and physiologically, Aries rules the head. It is the capital. It is the top. <clears throat> it likes to order, whether it's good, whether its orders are right or not, it likes to order things around. The head is the center of the nervous system. And for that reason, it has to have blood all the time. It's the only part of the body where some, uh, some sections of the brain are so vital that there are several sources of blood so that in case one gets plugged up, that the blood will still get there. The blood vessels don't dilate, though. So as a consequence, you lose a lot of energy through your head. 
She doesn't. She's got nice long hair. He doesn't. He's got a cap on inside. My goodness, she's got one on, too. That is almost an Aries kind of hat, too. <laughs> um, oh, where was I? Oh, because it doesn't... Uh, because there's all the blood vessels don't violate, uh, don't, it's a radiator. The head is a big radiator because the, the, the blood vessels don't dilate. So there you have a thing and it's opposite in the same sign. Like you have courage and chicken heartedness and you have a high temperature and you have radiation at the same time. Obviously, Aries, like the ascendant, rules the face when you say, face it. Or when you speak of loss of face, you've lost pride. If you say, I can't countenance that, and we all know what masking is, it's not something that Aries wants to do. Together with Mars, all of the voluntary muscles are ruled by Aries. Let's very quickly look at some of I'm sorry, Cherry, that we took so long. I'll try to be shorter next time. Take a flower if you like. No, I just happen to have an appointment. Yeah. Take a flower if you like. Let's look at some of the psychological and moral motivations, both for good and for bad. Some of the positives are challenge. Aries loves a challenge. And the more of a challenge that there is, the more it likes it. And it doesn't have to be an active challenge. Sort of like Mount Everest is there. Why did you climb it? I climbed it because it was there, and it was a challenge to climb it. Unity and singularity. If we're all uniform, we're all equal. We're all fighters together. But paradoxically, one little stripe makes a lot of difference between the unity and that Aries likes. Self-sustaining. I am and I can stand on my own. I don't need anybody else. Proving. There's something of insecurity in it, but it's a sign that feels it has to prove itself, whether it is positive or whether it is negative. Courage, fortitude, manliness, even in women, Another motivation is directness. We all like people who are straightforward and candid. Aries can sometimes be crude, but you know where you stand with them. It isn't all of that kind of complexity. It isn't all kinds of you know uh, obfuscation or convolution or anything of that kind. It's direct. And in that, it can be guileless. And it respects. If you've taken a fist to the jaw, you have a little bit of respect, even self-respect. So ideas of honor, do you keep your honor? Those are Aries things. In the negative, it's preemptive. That is, let's start this and get it over with right away, even if it isn't ripe, even if it's immature. It's got a hair trigger kind of consciousness. It's foolhardy and often very unobservant. It's not a high empathy sign. You might say it's a low compassion. 
it doesn't always feel uh, after it's run somebody down and trampled over them it can sometimes say mentally well well maybe they are in a bad shape but they got what they needed <laughs> it's not it's not a real tender sign again it can sometimes be too following fattishness is Aries and sometimes it can be uh, too individualistic Aries is probably the most masculine sign in the zodiac which means it'll never ask for directions it's just you know too you know doesn't want that it tends to be a monomaniac especially about energy it wants one thing and one thing only and uh, in its quest for simplicity taste and manners are extra baggage so for that reason Aries wherever it is in the zodiac in the horoscope tends to be offensive aggressively assertive demanding and of course it's arrogant and sometimes it's simplistic the simple idea is good enough even if the simple idea really doesn't catch, catch the true essence of something bipolarity it's a positive sign very active very assertive and extremely extrovertive you look on your sheets you can see that Aries is a cardinal sign it is a leadership sign it's a directing sign by element it is a fiery sign it's extremely pride proud on the other hand it's initiatory highly spirited fiery signs are always spirited this is a blazing fire like a leaping fire the ruler of Aries is Mars let's get this done the Sun is exalted in Aries and the exalted special quality that comes out is vitality there's nothing like the vitality of spring and the self-identification with anything and everything Venus has its detriment there and it wants to say can't we just love each other instead of fighting and Venus would much rather attract than push I had a friend that had a lot of Aries influence that thought that every door was a push door and if she pushed and it didn't open she'd kick it <laughs> she ended up marrying a mafioso but I think got out of that after a while uh, you don't ask too much what kind of a day did you have at the office today honey that's not something you do in a circumstance like that Saturn has its fall there Saturn likes to deliberate and there's just no opportunity to deliberate it likes justice and not punishment I'm going to skip doing keywords because uh, in another class I do that now let's look at Sun signs let's look at people who typify the sign of Aries by having their Sun in it Leopold Stokowski I like studying palmistry and hands and things like that uh, there was a man called Robert Sorrell who was a dance critic in New York City for many years and he wrote the book of the hand I've got a copy of it somewhere and what it does is it takes all of the things how expressive the hands are and there's a picture of Stokowski in there and he's going like this to somebody in the orchestra and you know that he's got power over that person and over the whole orchestra just for fun 
Bunsen was in Aries. Bunsen. You heard of a Bunsen burner? Here's one that you folks may not know. He was an old comedian on, in vaudeville. And the further life went along, the more Aries he became. So that eventually when he appeared on television, he appeared in a uniform. He didn't belong to anything with a uniform, but he appeared with a uniform. George Jessel, if you know who George Jessel was. Here's the one who fought for individualism, the famous monkey trial lawyer that was unfortunately on the wrong side, Clarence Darrow. If you like someone who represents masculinity, Steve McQueen was in Aries. Somebody who had a lot of personality that could get people's enthusiasm up, Sal Hurok. Everybody knows Sal Hirak. Yeah, I mean, I'm in this kind of a place. I'm going to have to get on the database and get all modern people because I, all the people I know. Sal Hirak was the famous impresario that brought all of the great artists to the stage. Um, somebody that is extremely driven and has so much energy he couldn't control it all. Somebody that would run out to the site to do his painting, Van Gogh. Someone that believed in individual liberties and was uh, self-reliant in everything, uh, including architecture and everything else. Thomas Jefferson was in Aries. Here's somebody that understood pride and courage and gave probably one of the best definitions of manliness that you could ever give. It wasn't the warrior, but it was a man. It was a man's man. The name of the movie, movie was called Derzu Uzala. And the, uh, it's by Akira Kurosawa. Are you familiar with Kurosawa? Great filmmaker. If you get a chance, just for the scenery that's in there, Derzu Uzala is a hunter. And boy, is he a, 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 he's a man's man. Here's somebody that's a little bit feisty, Emmy Lou Harris. Now, when you have a lot of energy and express it, what happens is that turns out to be leadership. Uh, Nikolai Lenin was in Aries. He's terrible as an executive uh, afterwards, and he had to be deposed by Stalin, basically. Here's one that's extremely brassy. Um, Herb Elpert. Here's one that was always proving himself again and again, Casanova. Here's someone that even in paintings that are static, they look active, Francisco Goya. Here's one that was extremely aggressive, and he even had a pet lion that went around with him in, in high society. And when the pet lion peed on somebody's fancy, <laughs> fancy gown, he laughed. Uh, Otto von Bismarck. Here's somebody that has a lot of powerful energy, Aretha Franklin. Here's somebody that could describe the vicious side of life, Tennessee Williams. One of my favorite all-time actors, Alec Guinness, sword fights and all. Here's um, somebody um, that is a pioneer and almost transsexual, Gloria Steinem, Aries. Here's someone that is everybody's Aries until he blew, a, blew an artery, uh, Richard Alpert, Baba Ramdas is in Aries. Here's somebody that was individuality at any price and over 200 years ago, painted his hair green and pink and things like that. Wrote that famous book of poetry, which is quite lovely poetry, and it isn't all what the title says, it's called Flowers of Evil. It's Baudelaire, if you're familiar with Baudelaire, extremely Aries. Here's a fiery purification, Lister. <laughs> Here's one, <laughs> the, the definition of offensiveness. Howard, Howard Cosell. <laughs> and here's someone that uh, 
is exceedingly plain and simple and gets his ideas across. I have actually some of his poetry on a CD-ROM with him reading it. Robert Frost was in the Aries. Simple ideas but direct and here's one that was simple in another way. Doris Day. Here's one that was fiercely competitive and uh, when Albert Steichen took his photo, he had him a, I had took a photo with him in one of those chairs where the arms curve like that and the light was glinting off the chair and then if you look at it, it looks like he's got a dagger in his hand. J.P. Morgan. Uh, here's one extremely confident, Pearl Bailey. Virility, Gregory Peck. Courage, uh, extreme courage, St. Teresa of Avila would do what no one else would do. Here's one that's very bold. If you can get some of his renditions to this day, if you can get a Wagner by this, by this director, you've really got something. Herbert von Karhan. Karyan, Karhan is, uh, the Spanish is getting so much into me. Here's one that has all of the majesty, majesty. Johann Bach. Here's the machismo, Marlon Brando, vigor, Haydn, identity, I think, therefore I am. Descartes was in Aries. Here's another transsexual Aries, Claire Booth Luce. Charlie Chaplin, self-reliance, and he always wanted a rejuvenation. He wanted to go to youth. <laughs> That's the thing about Aries that they sometimes, uh, male Aries and even female Aries like uh, toy boys. Well, or toy, you know, they like younger people. I should say that. Una O'Neill, when she married him, I think was 14 years old or something like that. And he was in his 50s. Self assurance. Eric Fromm. Here's somebody that was a really hustling guy, but he was a mean SOB. He still is. Pete Rose. Here's somebody that's a complete challenger. Madeline Marino Hare. Here's for the criminal savage type Merle Hanker. <laughs> uh, in abstract, Aries rules soldiers, athletes, builders, badges, Warriors, explorers, arsonists, woodworkers, emergency workers especially, wars, knife fighters, police, firemen, fads, some mechanics, some agriculture, and uniforms. All right, the ascent. We're taking a. It's going. It's a little slow tonight. I'm very sorry for that, but we'll be shorter next time. The ascendant indicates the physical body, and there are each rising sign has certain characteristics about it. Aries rising is very energetic. They can't sit. And very often with, with Aries rising, there are angular features and a sort of a pelvic thrust where the pelvis is thrust way out with Aries rising. Restless. And they have that aggressiveness and like the lead with their nose. The muscle to fat ratio in Aries rising is highly on the muscular side. It's a tapered kind of body, a lot of triangles. Everything, when you think of Aries, you think a lot of triangular features. Often high cheekbones, very often rubifacient, which means red faced. Bushy eyebrows, sometimes a bird like face usually always alert, 
very often narrow hips, subject to rashes and a tendency to swagger. Let's very quickly go through some things about the first house. Boy, this is going on awfully long. But I had a good time. I hope you guys did. The first house rules the physical body, the little universe in which we live day by day by day. All of our creativity is finalized through the activity in the physical body. Idiosyncrasies. Each person has physical idiosyncrasies and they are most likely indicated by the first house. The face. The first house represents the basic physical personality. What you present to the world, even your style of clothing, is what the first house represents. I have a friend that teaches astrology in San Francisco. He's one of my first students. And he teaches his students for the first year or so to get them used to the whole idea. He teaches them the difference between the sun sign and the ascendant. The ascendant is what the world sees and the sun sign is what you see. Very important thing. So there's the personal presence. It represents outer personality. The body has a life of its own. Another thing ruled by the first house are new beginnings. Even early childhood, very important. If you look at the, child, at, at the horoscope of a new baby, don't talk about what it's going to be when it's an adult. That is front-loading and that is a uh, producing for the child's parents. They're, they're, they're inclined in that direction right away. What you want to talk about is the early childhood. You want to talk about the first house and planets in the first house because that's what's most important in early childhood. The conditions when you start things. Somebody has Mars in the first house, they're a fast starter. Somebody who sat, has Saturn in the first house, they're a slow starter. The first house also rules externals. Our body is how we, the spirit, interact with the external world. And so the first house represents our external relationships. Our immediate environment. Sigmund Freud had Scorpio in the first house and he lived above a butcher shop. And all he could see in the world was sex. It's really obvious the uh, way the first house works in that way. Some people with watery signs rising have to be around water. Just last week I have a friend who has a uh, son is in a fiery sign but has a watery rising sign. She says, I'm looking for a boyfriend and he has to want to wa be on water, either in a canoe or a boat or something like that. We want to be on the water frequently. The first house also represents first-hand experience. It's on-the-job training. It's what you learn by doing it yourself. It also indicates how, with our senses, we relate to the external world, what we see. It has to do with first impressions, the kind of impressions we draw from the world and the kind of impressions that we give to the world. So it's our basic outer approach to things. I have Virgo in the first house, 
And for me, things have to be in order. They don't have to be particularly clean, but as long as they're in order, that's all that counts. We'll let the cancer people do all the mopping. <laughs> yeah. well, what's a little dust among friends anyway? That's about as much as I want to say tonight. We had to cut some, but we would have been here too long. We've been here almost two hours. In fact, we have been here two hours. Oh, I got a couple of other things here. I should put them off. In abstract, the first house represents environmental concerns. The present. New projects. Moving, if you're going to move. Outer images, the United States has Mars in the first house, and we are a warring nation to the rest of the world. Immediate concerns, the military, beginnings, first and second together represent natural resources. Birth statistics, uh, birth rates, things like that are first house things. Sudden outer changes. And if somebody's asking you a question, that's always indicated by the first house. But that's that horary astrology that we began with and won't go with any further. It's, it's sort of the I Ching of astrology. Yeah. That's it. I'm sorry for being so long. But now you've got a, a good introduction, and we can go a little faster each time, unless I start telling stories again.